Trucker here. Welcome to my channel. I hope you enjoy it. And we're coming into downtown Athens, Ontario. On our way home this morning from the truck show. We got about a 400 mile ride today. Quaint, some restaurants, some shops. Everybody was very hospitable and nice and friendly and had a good time here in Athens. Can't wait to come back again. Fancy trucker. And Tim Hortons. I was told, Chuck Snow told me that Tim Hortons is uh, all about the quality of the water. Because I've never had, really? a, never had a good one in like 20 years. Of the ago. water? The water that they use. Come on now. determines the difference. Oh, in the food? In the, in the coffee. The taste oh, of the Oh, in the coffee, coffee yeah. yeah. Let's get some Tim Hortons while we're in Canada. I'll trust the Canadian when it comes to Tim Hortons coffee. <laughs> yeah. Have you seen anybody pay for pay for a toll with a credit card before? Well, I did it all over Europe last month. Oh, really? I was amazed because normally I get caught without the local currency. Yeah. And uh, all we did because of these new uh, ch chips in your cards. Yeah. Everywhere around the world, they seem to work. So we just pull up at a toll in Italy or France, just just like you would pay for groceries. Unreal! Oh, look at this. Ready? Yeah. I got one 
you at home can play along. of Interstate 81. fun in the snow and the ice. Must be. <laughs> it's slippery. What you got there? Well, this is the, we just passed over the bridge here in Thousand Islands. That's the, what they call one of the Lakers. Yeah. One of the Great Lake. Uh, Wait, is that the ship we just saw on the river? Yeah. How do you know that? Uh, I have an app where I track ships around the world because in my business in the freight market, I like to see what's what's been called on what vessels and where and where the big ships are going and how much freight's going into a port. So these guys haul uh, taconite, which is iron ore pellets, yep. and they typically load in Duluth uh, and then bring it around through the Great Lakes into uh, down into this area and they use it in the steelworks in the motor industry around Detroit. Yep. So, <laughs> that's what uh, that's what the Great Lakes. So you remember the Edmund Fitzgerald? Yeah, that's what I was thinking of when I saw that ship. Right. So Edmund Fitzgerald, November 11, there about went down, falling, um, going back to load. A load of iron ore in yeah. the song. Yes. Yeah. yeah, and it's little pellets. Ah. And if you look, if you go to Duluth, they bring it in on a train, and the train opens up and drops it into these chutes, and all these chutes drop the taconite down into each of the bays on the top of the lake. Up. And most of them are self-unloaders. They've got a conveyor underneath the ship that takes it along and then up into a conveyor that then pumps it up into the where the discharge point, which could be another building, or mm -hmm. if it's salt or gravel, it'll be on the dock. So it's just I'm just fascinated with freight. And, uh, Amazing. And whether it's air cargo, I, I'll often sit in my hammock where I am in Massachusetts because we're under the New York, sorry, we're under the uh, JFK Boston flight path from Europe. Yep. So, you know, for example, when I see the uh, British Airways A380 at 1pm, you know tourism is picking up because they only start running it before public holidays in the US or big events in the UK. So they only put the extra... Wait a minute, you're in your hammock yeah. and you notice the British Airways plane well, flying over your head and that says something to you. I've got another app. <laughs> now, what, why what app is that? It's, it's flight aware. 
Okay. It's 30 bucks a year. But why I do it is every plane has about eight tons of belly cargo mm -hmm. that could go on a truck. Okay. So I want to see how much cargo is being hauled because not so much the belly cargo because that's more passenger, right? But when you see more planes coming in, it means more tourism, more traffic, more rental cars, more gasoline, more food, right? Summer. But when you see the four engine 747s, because most of these new jets are two engines and they only leave two trails. Mm -hmm. But you can always tell an air freighter with like 85, 100 tonnes of air cargo because they leave four in, they've got four contrails, four trails oh, out of wow. their engines. So most of the 747s these days are air freighters. And there's hundreds of them that run around the world, but it's another, the reason why truckers should watch air cargo, air cargo is the most expensive, it's the most time sensitive. When, when things are pumping, air cargo is busy. So right now, uh, capacity has been very tight from Asia to the US for holiday season inventory. So air cargo has been very busy. Uh, but it's because it's expensive, when things slow down, it's the first thing to be cut. Mm. So if you're thinking about trucking, one of the barometers I watch is how much air cargo is moving. Because when I see air cargo in volumes moving globally starting to drop, yep. that means we're headed for a slowdown in freight volumes on the truckload side. Now, air cargo is only 1% of global tonnage, but it's 34% of the value. Mm. So it means all the high value electronics and fashion and anything that's expensive pharmaceuticals are going on planes. Yep. So it's a really good barometer for the expensive side of our freight market. Let's start from the beginning. Oh, I like your sunglasses. You like Did you change those just for the camera? Yeah. It's very Hollywood. <laughs> what do we like Mike? Look, we're like twins. <laughs> Both wore t-shirts today. Did not consult each other on the wardrobe changes. Oh, I got my Truckee California one on. Most people Oh, I like that. This was Australia. They'd say Truckee, because in Australia, that's what they, you're not right. a trucker, you're a Truckee. Yes. And uh, so I, I like this shirt because it's got dual meanings for me, but most people don't get it. Do you know what's ironic? My old iron trucking is also from California. Yeah. Absolutely, from Instagram. Yeah. Send me the shirt. Let's start from the beginning. Uh -huh. Tell me about your childhood. Uh, how did you get into trucking? So, and how did you get to where you are today? Go. Yeah, long journey. It's a long way from where I came in a little town of 100 people in Australia, in a little town called Lagan. Laga? Lagan? Lagan. Uh, a lot of towns in Australia are named after English towns. That's where we were settled by the English. Mm -hmm. And uh, we lived on a farm, Dad had a truck, and uh, we would haul our... We, where I come from is the seed potato capital of Australia, Crookwall. Okay. And they grow seed potato disease-free that people then haul away to put in their own crop. But we, had, we grew hay, like most farmers do, and um, at about age six, we had a, an ACCO, what they call international ACCO, a cab over. And uh, we'd put a device on the side of the truck that as you drove along, it would pick up the hay bale and run it up the side of the trailer and, and my dad would stack the hay on our, on our straight truck. Okay. But I would drive it, so I'm like five or six years old and I would sit <laughs> on a cushion and it had one of those cable throttles. So you could pull the cable out and turn it and it would lock the speed. Mm -hmm. And uh, he'd just sit me in the seat and I'd drive around and I'd be looking out the side and I'd have divide. This device had a couple of uh, wedges on it that you would guide the bales into and that's how we would drive around the field. Wow. And by the time I got to nine I was driving our 1418 Mercedes Benz on the road at night. While nine years old. Yeah. But I'd already been so before that everybody knew I could drive in our town because when we would take fat lambs to Sydney markets which is right under where the Olympic Stadium was in the 2000 Olympics that's mm -hmm. where the meatworks were we would take fat lambs down to the markets every night and my dog and I would unload all of the drivers' trucks. So there'd be like eight or nine trucks go down from our town with sheep and they would all go off and drink coffee and I would back each of these trucks in. Now remember that day they are single drive um, R190s with Cummins's, single drive um, 38 foot trailers with spread axles. Mm. So not easy to back but no power steering. Okay except for my dad's Mercedes Benz, which had power steering and a five-speed synchro mesh. Everything else was old Kenworths and internationals. So they were hard to back, 
that I, I would uh, back everyone's truck into the ramps and I would unload them with my dog. And I talked to your my, dog. Yeah, what you, what dog. did your dog do? Was he there for moral support or did he actually do something? No, he's a work dog, sheep dog. He's an Australian sheep dog. So he, I taught him to undo the chains with his nose as he <laughs> goes through the crate. Well, we call him a crate, you call him yep. a cattle trailer or a pot. The, the, the gate was had a little chain on a loop and it, he, could, he could lift it up. So I would just let him go and uh, I would change the decks as we emptied one deck. We had three decks of sheep. And he would just go through and, and the sheep would run out and you know, take the truck off and bring another one in. So that was, you know, by the time I was nine, nine through like 14, I did a lot of driving on the road at night and then go to school the next morning. Ah. And, and the funny story is when I, in, in primary school, my parents uh, got a call one day and they said, your son's a terrible liar. A terrible liar. A liar. He tells these stories about what he does at night. <laughs> and and uh, mum and dad said, well, that's that's just the half of it. Here's what he really does. Ah. And they said, really? You let him do that? I said, well, like, you know, yeah, absolutely, because we've got to get home to school. So I, I, I wouldn't change it for anything. I grew up with adults. Um, what happened, though, my dad and mum decided to sell the business because we were headed towards being owner-operators and running the, the haulage business for because we, we grew the truck business, we had four or five trucks and we were hauling uh, sheep and potatoes and cattle for all the local farmers. Mm -hmm. so that, but back in those days you couldn't haul more than 100 miles because the railroads owned the long haul freight. Oh. So there was kind of regulations around permitting but we'd always go 100 miles and then pull up and wait to see if the police were following us. Mm -hmm. And if they weren't, then we'd head off in the night, deliver them long distance. So nothing much has changed in that regard. So he sold the business and because he wanted his kids to get an education. So we moved to Canberra. And uh, and, and you know what it's like. You grow up in trucks. You can't you can't get away from it. Yep. Um, Dad was driving fuel tankers at the time and, and gravel trucks. So I was always in and out of trucks on weekend. My uncle had a 359 Peterbilt with a Corvette dash like this one. And, and that's I, rare in Australia to have a 359. How did he then, get it? I bought it out in parts and boxes. Oh, oh. The famous uh, Robbie at uh, the truck stop in Yass bought it out from America, brought it out, built it. It was in boxes and parts, built this magnificent truck. It's in a museum. Oh, wow. Uh, built it and, and then the uh, guy that owns the Caltex fuel distributor bought this truck for my uncle to drive and it had a 400 big cam Cummins, I think it had a 20 speed Spicer and it was just a beautiful 359 with a Corvette wood grain dash. And when I'd ride with them as a kid I just thought one day I'm going to have a truck like this. Yeah. So uh, that was sort of, that was during my educational years and then ended up doing a bunch of jobs but over the course of you know, my first 40 years before moving to the US, I did about two and a half million miles as an over the road model driver, managing trucks, owning trucks, you know, running large free mm -hmm. fleets. The biggest job I had was general manager of a, a business called Hunt Specialised Transport. We distributed case farm machinery all over Australia. Oh, wow. So that we had drop decks, specialised ramp trailers, wide, heavy, all that stuff. So it was a really good job, but we were always coming to the States to buy equipment, help load the, the Willemson boats. So it always had a fascination with the, the US market. Mm. And uh, I got out of trucking, I, I won't support you with the details, but I was speaking at a conference on fatigue in transportation in 1999. And having done a few million miles as a driver, I considered myself an expert at falling asleep at the wheel. <laughs> so speaking- Did you ever fall asleep at the wheel? Every night, all the time. Come on. Yeah, absolutely. What do you mean? Yeah, run off the road, fall asleep, never hit anything. Just luck. Did a lot of stupid things when I was younger. Yeah. Um, I used to drive with uh, the window down and the engine brake on. Because if you fall asleep and run off the road, sure. there's a change in the pitch and the engine brake comes on. That's how stupid it was. But we were pushing really hard. So remember, we were working 24 hours a day. This was really hard work. I was working two jobs, you know, do night, a night run. Uh, one night I might go with FH Transport to uh, do a changeover or a, a swap or a meet, yep. whatever you call it, one night. And then in the morning I'd uh, unload a truck in and around Brisbane or Sydney and then. So I had, I had different jobs um, in my 30s. Uh, but 
at this conference, there was a whole heap of global academics talking about this, they were researching fatigue. And this was in the 90s when sleep deprivation and fatigue and sleep apnea screening was just becoming a thing. Mm -hmm. Sleep medicine was becoming a thing. And a Harvard professor was speaking right after me. It was a chance meeting and he said, would you come to Boston and run my consulting business, Dr. Martin Maureen at Circadian Technologies? And he organized our visas and everything and I moved, we moved our family. Um, and I was able to help all of the scientists and computer engineers figure out models on how to predict when drivers would fall asleep. Because sleep is the easiest thing to predict. If you give me your ELD data, I can tell you fairly accurately when and where you can sleep based on your sleep personality and circadian rhythm. So I became a bit of a specialist in human physiology mm -hmm. and over the course of the years developed some techniques around how to teach drivers to get better quality sleep as opposed to quantity. And, um, and from that, you know, I've built a really good career here in the US. The last eight years has been in the freight market. Not hold so on, much. Hold on, let's go back for a second. Okay. How do drivers sleep better? Okay. So you know how your dad, my dad would say, we're going to pull up for an hour. Yeah. An hour's the wrong number. Have you ever had an hour nap and woken up and felt worse? Yes. Every time, right? So, so we sleep in, we have, you know, circadian rhythms are rhythms around the day, mm -hmm. but there's a thing called ultradian rhythms. And ultradian rhythms occur every 90 minutes, every hour and a half. Okay. So when you're driving a truck, you'll go through a high point and a low point. After an hour and a half, you hit this low point in alertness, you wind the window down, you scratch and pick and have a cigarette, and you think, I'm getting a bit tired, and then you pick up again, and your alertness curve picks up. So you've got this roller coaster of alertness throughout the day. Now, sleep occurs in blocks of 90 minutes. So you go through light sleep, then you drift into deep sleep at about 40 minutes, and you stay there for about another 30 to 40 minutes, and then after 70 minutes, start to wake up, the brain wakes up, and you finish your sleep cycle with a dream after about 90 minutes. So you go light sleep, deep sleep, light sleep, dream. And you have, and a good night's sleep is four or five of these together. So the key, so the quality of sleep comes from each of the brainwave patterns. So a, a 20 minute nap is light brainwave activity, and that rejuvenates alertness, vigilance, cognition, yeah. concentration. Deep sleep, what you look like when you're in deep sleep is your your body's tossing and turning, but your brain is dead to the world. Yeah. But you're tossing and turning because it's fixing your physical fatigue, muscles, hair, skin, bone, tissue. And then when you come back out of a dream, a dream, you go mm -hmm. into a state of paralysis. Oh. Your body shuts off all of your muscles except your eyes and your heart. That's why it's called rapid eye movement because your eyes are darting back and forward. What that stage of sleep does, it does all the memory consolidation, deals with your mood, depression, and all of that. So the different stages of sleep fix the brain and the body. Mm -hmm. and, you, and if you get an hour though, an hour takes you into the bottom of deep sleep, where the brain's dead to the world. And as a trucker, if you wake from deep sleep, that's what fatigue is. You wake up feeling groggy, tired, moody, lethargic, disorientated. And you have to have a cup of coffee that takes 20 minutes to kick in sure. to get back to reality. But if you'd let that hour on nap go to an hour and a half, you'd have been awake already because the brain was dreaming. Mm. So the key to sleep is sleeping in blocks of an hour and a half. One and a half, three, four and a half, six, seven and a half, nine. And what you'll find is as you get older, you'll always be waking up during the night roughly every hour and a half. And then you drift off into sleep again. Now, when you get into your mid-40s, that wake period can be an hour. You can wake for a long period of time wow. before you drift off. So how you set your alarm clock is for multiples of an hour and a half. So now on your 10 hour break, if you've only got seven hours to sleep, you can't get five sleep cycles, which is seven and a half. Well, you can four. only get four, which right. is six. Now, if you try and get another hour, you'll feel worse all day because that, oh that sleep inertia that you wake up with from the middle of a sleep cycle right. hangs around your brain like a, it's like a fog. Now, here's why it's critical for truckers because the more sleep deprived you are, the more severe the sleep inertia and the worse you feel. And then you end up like my father, self-medicating all day with cigarettes, coffee and beer to try and get through the day. 
Yeah. And then that screws up your sleep the next night, and you're on this roller coaster. Yeah. And uh, I've done a lot of sleep classes, and if you can get the quality of sleep from sleeping in box for an hour and a half, it changes your whole perspective on life. You'll run. Uh, my data shows you run about 10% more miles per week just through better quality sleep yep. and in the confines of hours of service and you'll be healthier. So a guy on a, a 10 hour break, are you saying he should sleep six Minimum or seven six. and a half or nine hours? Correct, that's it. So here's the key. Six hours is the bare minimum you need to stay healthy. If you get less than six cumulative over a day, you're gonna be really unhealthy. You're gonna develop all sorts of psychiatric problems, health problems, heart disease, hypertension, weight gain. Six hours is like a, you, you can, it's like you drop off a cliff right. in terms of health outcomes. Six hours, four sleep cycles, and then supplement it with naps. So sleep doesn't have to be in one solid block. Mm -hmm. You can get three hours and then three. So if you're having a 10 hour break during the day, a lot of guys will say, I'm wide awake. Well, what you do is you, you sleep for say, two sleep cycles, get up, and then think, I'll just go back and have another two sleep cycles after lunch. Ah. What you don't want to do is stress, because you can't sleep seven hours straight, sure. or eight hours straight. So if you take the stress out of this, and just get sleep in blocks of an hour and a half, when you feel tired, you'll actually function much better and be much happier and you'll enjoy the job. Do you use the, is this how you sleep? Religiously. Religiously. Yeah, I don't have to set an alarm clock anymore because I wake up at the end of an hour and a half really oh my all God. the time. That's amazing. Yeah. Just so the Harvard prof professor says, come to America, Dean. On a plane the next week. You're kidding me. Yep. Just pack up, leave, Gone, everything. Yeah. My wife left a really high paying, high profile job with the government. Moved out two boys, one was one, one was three. Here's the funny part of that. The one year old has an American and an Australian accent. The three year old is now 26, has just an, uh, just an Australian accent. But what made you decide to pack up, your wife leave a big high paying job? Was, was he offering like a, a good salary for you to move? It's an opportunity. Where we were in Canberra, we just didn't see a future there because Canberra's the, it's like Washington mm -hmm. or Ottawa, it's the seat of government. And if you look at the career path, you can see your whole 40 year, 40 year career path. And I didn't want that. I'd always been on the road, moving, and I wanted, I wanted more out of life. Mm -hmm. And I as it said earlier, I've always been traveling, and I had been to America buying wreck trucks, yep. sending them back to Australia in containers and selling them as used parts in one of our businesses. Um, that was called Amtruck. We'd come over here and buy wreck trucks, okay. take them to Kaufman, Texas put them in shipping containers and send them to Australia and put them on shelves and sell them as, as used truck parts. So I'd always loved coming to America. So when you're in Australia, when you, Australia's love to travel because you're so far away. Mm -hmm. One of the first things you do when you finish school is you travel, you have a gap year and you travel. Yeah. So I'd always wanted to, like, just wanted to travel. I mean, I always had a fascination with America because we'd, we'd just come out of an era where we had all the Hollywood movies. Mm -hmm. where where the truck driver was an icon. Yes. And and so and, and there's a lot of truckers that joined the industry because of Hollywood. Sure. And so I just always had fascination with the trucks and we moved here and uh, moved to Boston. We've always been in Boston. It's always been home. It's very much like living in Australia. In what and way? Just the people, uh, oh. the culture, uh, not, the geog not the geography, but just the people. Okay, the people. interesting. Uh, Canadians are very much like Australians. There's no coincidence where Australia and Canada are part of the British Commonwealth, where the mm -hmm. King is now head of government. Uh, as a yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that was sort of our life. We made it home, and I guess we were always sort of adventurous. And we met a bunch of people. We met a lot of expats that lived over here. We built a community, um, but it's always strange because. You know, on Thanksgiving, we don't have anybody. Uh, yeah. Right? So we don't have family here. So it was always strange when there'd be major, you know, holiday events. Sure. Um, and so what we ended up doing is strange. Well, we kind of found each other, some UK people, some New Zealand people. Mm -hmm. We'd all get together on Thanksgiving. Oh, nice. So we've kind of built a community. Most of the community we've built has been through school and trucking. That's when the boys grew up. So you get to America, now you're your strength, you've been to America, but you're now living here. Yeah. That's gotta be daunting. 
especially without cell phones, because now and I've young got, children do. Yeah, and now I'm here. Now we're trying to drive around with the Rand McNally Atlas. Uh huh. Yeah. And uh, and of course, when we first moved here, every one of our relatives wanted to come over and visit us because uh -huh. now they got free accommodation. <laughs> And we were very hospitable. We drove them around everywhere. My wife became a tour guide. Yeah. And everybody came over. We'd take them to uh, the mansions of Rhode Island or the lakes or, mm -hmm. you know, do some leaf peeping around fall up in Maine and Vermont. Sure. So we got to see a lot of the country just by taking our relatives around. And, uh, but with my job, uh, with my job at Cicadia Technologies, I was traveling to all the trucking companies all over the country, helping them build 24-7 uh, schedules for their drivers so they got good quality sleep. So what my specialty is, is designing biocompatible schedules, which is designing a truck schedule around the driver's sleep pattern, not trying to shoehorn sleep into pickup and delivery times. Because if you, have, if you sleep at the same time every day, and you build your work around it, everything becomes much better. Most truck companies will say, you can't do that. Well, you go to your customer and you tell them what you want to do and you'll be really surprised at how accommodating they are. So at first, your message isn't well received? No. And how, how, how is your message received with drivers? They, oh, they love it. Because if you can if you can build the driver's schedule around his sleep, mm -hmm. they are they are happy. So why this works, I hosted the DOT, the FMCSA and Transport Canada in 97 in Australia. And we toured them around all of our fatigue management pilot companies. Because Australia has the world's best fatigue management program, it's called FMP. So in Australia, you don't have this 10 hour break deal, mm -hmm. but you have to take six hours continuous sleep, but whenever you want. So, ah. it's, so it's, there's a lot of flexibility in, in how you build your day. Uh, I mean, you can work 14 hours a day in Australia, but you've got to take your have your continuous break. Together. So you can work till you're actually tired and actually ready to take that six hours instead of yeah. sitting there stressing, going, okay, the clock told me I have to sleep now. So and that's, I'm, that's well, why we have better outcomes because we built we built regulations around the freight task, mm -hmm. not prescriptive like here and trying to shoehorn every driver into a little narrow confine of regulations which don't work for most people. So that's why most people think paper logs were all about running more miles and hours. That was part of it, but it was also about the flexibility. Because you could pull up when you're tired, drive yep. when you're wide awake, and the numbers still added up to 10 and eight, or 11 and three and 10. But how do these sleep schedules correlate into driver's um, uh, appointment times? So that's when you've got to change the appointment times to match around, and so the biocompatible uh, schedule is, we, we only book appointment times around your schedule, your sleep schedule. And how do the shippers and receivers? Most of them are fine with it. They are? Yeah. You That's just, amazing. You've just got to work with your shippers. Right. And most companies are afraid to do this because their first reaction is, because if it starts as a safety program, operations say, that'll never work because all we'll have are drivers pulled up sleeping everywhere, which is rubbish. Because right. what you'll have is drivers doing more miles per week and they'll be more on time and they quit less. Because right. they're, they're not sleep deprived. But I can't imagine calling up uh, a Walmart distribution center and saying, my driver needs to get his sleep first. Well, he'll get there when he when he gets there. So, so you're happy for us to take risks and force the driver to stay awake? Yes, we need our stop rate. Yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> Plenty of attorneys yeah. never feel they with you. Yes, sir. So yes, I've sir. been to a number of big companies, and once you talk to them, they're known and knowledgeable. Mm, yeah. They can't not do something. Right, so the smart companies might talk to you. But sure. if, if you've got a good shipper, and I think Walmart's probably not a good example because they're too big. Okay. But but they do care about safety. They, they would oh, listen, yeah. I'm sure. But if you've got a medium-sized shipper and you've got contract freight in and out, have the discussion and see if you can work your appointment pickup times around a driver's schedule. You'll be really surprised because it's it's being done in the oil industry, the, uh, the nuclear power industry, the railroads, and the airlines. There's no reason why this wouldn't work in trucking. Sure. Have you ever met any drivers who um, went, took your plan and used it and implemented it and had some feedback? Hundreds and hundreds. I've done about 700 sleep classes for truckers and their families at uh, trucking companies. Wow. And to a driver, it's the most impactful thing 
they've ever been taught in their life because no one teaches you how to sleep. They naively say, be compliant with this logbook, but on the 10 hour break, they don't tell you that caffeine's got a half-life of six hours. Ah. And if you drink a big coffee at 3 a.m., half it's trying to keep you awake at 9 a.m. Sure. when you're starting a 10 hour break. And you don't, and you don't get, get taught how to control light, the timing of light. Gene, how has the government responded to all the sleep science that's out there? Slowly, frustratingly slowly. Um, it took uh, from 1936 to 2004 to change the hours of service regulation. That was a big step forward. Uh, they adopted some of our practices from Australia. Um, the problem is that if one size fits all doesn't really work because a lot of us grew up with the flexibility of paper logs and when electronic logs came along suddenly we lost that flexibility and by flexibility I mean being able to pull up when you're tired and drive when you're awake. Right? So when I worked at Qualcomm I studied paper log and electronic fleets over 10 years, billions of miles and I looked at their accidents and paper log fleets were 30% safer than electronic log fleets which all of us that have worked at paper log fleets understand. Yes. Because we pull up and we're tired. Now, a 14 hour clock works against you because the clock's ticking and a one and a half hour nap in the afternoon doesn't reset your body clock. It's illogical. So this prescriptive window they put around drivers to try and make them safer, I would argue has made them worse. Uh, because you're trying to rush and fit a finite amount of work into these hours. Anyway, we all know the problems there. So I, the government's been pretty good at adapting the science. What they haven't been good at is operationalizing it into schedules, mm -hmm. how we work, how freight flows. So in Australia, we have a focus on a two-week window, 168 hours in a two-week period, for example, or 144 on a urban area, 144 in two weeks, as opposed to 72 in a week. Because freight flows differently over a week and you know, a two week period, whereas if you put a prescriptive limit around a 24 hour period, that's not how freight flows. Freight flows differently on a Monday than it does on a Wednesday than it does on a Saturday. Okay. And, and sometimes when the freight's not flowing, you can have a longer sleep. When the freight's flowing, you've got to go. So we did a pretty good job building flexibility into our hours of service and what you've if you've heard me talk here, you'll hear me advocate for we need the flexibility of paper logs in the electronic log device. Yes. And by that I mean, give me the flexibility to put together the 11 how I want and the 10 hours off how I want, mm -hmm. with the exception of I need a half hour break every five, yep. as you should, and, you, and you've got to be able to sleep six continuous within the 10. So if you sleep six continuous, and then the other four is made up of naps strategically mm -hmm. throughout the day. Or Hour and a half naps? Yep. You are as healthy as you're ever gonna be as a trucker, mm. and safer, and productive. You'll run more miles, you'll be safer. I've published lots of reports and data that prove that. So what I did in 2005, myself and our Harvard professor, and Sam Wilkes, another guy from Atlanta, we built a thing called that we wanted to apply for an exemption to hours of service rule 395.14, which allowed us to put together the 11, the 10, and the three, however we wanted. And it was called, I called it, hours of sleep. Okay. It was a deliberate play on words, <laughs> because I wanted the focus to be on the sleep, the health of the driver, sleep apnea screening, the schedule design. We would get all the schedules the drivers run approved, you know, by this group of sort of people. And what it showed, if you could do the 11 whenever you want and have no 14 hour clock and a 10 hour break with six hours continuous, you could run another hour per day on the road. You could actually get another 60 miles per day. And at two bucks a mile, that's another 120. You know, it's, it's another, I think it was like something like another, it was almost like a thousand dollars extra revenue a week per truck. Wow. And, and of course, we all know that. That's what paper logs we did with paper logs is we were incredibly efficient. We're also incredibly safe. Now, there are also the rat bags out there that did a lot of miles. Yeah. And I was one of them in the 80s. Yeah. But, and, but even guilty. now, guilty, guilty in the 90s. All guilty. Yeah. But even now, there are still people circumventing the ELD system. Yes. So there's always a percentage that do that. I don't have any problems as long as they don't hit me. 
Yes. Just blow past me. <laughs> yep. So the hours of service, hours of sleep consortium, we had about 12 truckload carriers, some of the bigger fleets were involved in this, where we wanted an exemption to hours of service because we'd be safer and we'd run more miles. Well, long story short, the FMCSA wouldn't approve it. The uh, problem you've got in Washington is there's a lot of anti-trucking lobby groups. The railroads are one, uh, other LTL carriers are one. Um, and, and what it came down to was it got into an hours of service subcommittee at the ATA and they voted it down because the non-truckload people, and they'll deny this, but the non-truckload carriers didn't want a handful of truckload carriers to be more productive, ah. even if it meant being more safe. Unreal. And it was the most, I was gutted because I knew it was the best thing for the industry because I knew from my experience in Australia, having hosted Transport Canada, the DOT and the FMCSA, and helped them understand how to run driver schedules and have safer outcomes, I was gutted because I knew it would work because it had worked and we'd worked it as drivers and they decided that it wasn't something they would do and they denied the application. And to this day I haven't given up on it because you will hear me say over and over like a crack record, you can be 100% compliant with hours of service but sound asleep at the wheel at the same time. Unreal. So it doesn't matter how compliant you are with terrible regulations, you can still fall asleep at the wheel. And that's why fleets have got to do much more than compliance and work with drivers on their schedules and build the day around their sleep not build their sleep into whatever work they've got. So Dean, what are your thoughts on speed limiters on trucks? Be totally ineffective. Uh, the terminal races will create more accidents than they uh, prevent. It's not about speed, it's not about linear speed. Yeah. Um, it's about inappropriate speed for the conditions. 75 north of Bangor, Maine, not a problem. 75 out near Winnemucca, not a problem. Yep. Um, but 75 through Portsmouth, New Hampshire, yeah, back off. Yeah, you've got to slow down. So it comes down to driver training, uh, appropriate speed for the conditions. Uh, most professional drivers are quite okay at 70, 75. Oh, that is the service wise. Yeah. I'm sorry. Keep going. Um, uh, so speed limits for all trucks won't achieve the safety outcome because, in my opinion, speed limits for all trucks is just another way to make capacity tighter. It's a bit like the. How's that? Well fewer trucks you've got on the road, the more rates go up, right? And that helps, ironically, everybody, right? But it just means there's fewer drivers can join the industry and stay in the industry. But why would there be fewer trucks just because they have speed limiters? Well, if you slow, if you slow all of the owner operators and small fleets down to say, I don't know, let's say it's 65. Yeah. Right now, a speed limited fleet at 65 so an owner operator in DAT's spot market business that's speed limited to say 75, they do 50% more miles per truck day than a speed limited fleet at say 63 on the pedal. It's the difference between 400 miles a day and 600. Now most of us in the owner operator world will run 600 day in day out all day and do it safely. Yep. But if you start to slow us down, what it means is you miss that extra leg, that extra load that week. Mm -hmm you might be held over at night when you wouldn't normally because your miles in each hour are higher than the miles in each hour of the speed limited fleet. So it's not about miles per hour, it's how many miles you do in each hour. Which doesn't mean you have to speed, it just means you have to pull up less. Yeah. You're a better trip planner. Yeah. And if you trip plan better, like most owner operators do, you can still be safe and run your 11 hours and run 600 miles and be very profitable and yeah, safe. So, so yeah. speed limits, you can't talk about speed limiters for all trucks and not talk about pay because it's disingenuous to the drivers by saying we want you to be safer but we're not going to pay you for the three hours you spend on a loading dock every day. Right. You can't do that because if you see you're doing less miles. You're doing less miles yeah. and giving shippers an hour and a half to two hours free time every day. No, you have you have to pay drivers for their time. And that's that's what they do in Europe, Mike. 
You and I have just been there. Drivers are paid by the hour, they're paid a salary. Oh, really? They're limited to 90 kilometres an hour or 55 miles an hour. They're paid for every minute of the day. And you see how they drive. They are just plodding along. There's no yep. stress. They're not in and out of lanes, passing each other, There's trying no... to get, get up on one each other. They're limited to nine hours a day. Yep. They do, you know, maybe 36 in a week or 40 in a push. But these guys are fairly happy. It's a good lifestyle. They're not stressed. They're not rushing. They're not overtaking. They're not texting each other and cutting off and abusing each other over a CB. So why, how come we haven't adopted that in the United States? It's, it's one of the great things of a free market. When the getting's good, it's good. Oh yeah, it's great. But when it's bad, it's bad, uh, right? Oh yeah. And it swings and roundabouts. You've oh, got to yeah. take the good with the bad yep. in this economy. And the smart, the smart carriers that made hundred thousand dollars a year gross profit in the pandemic like many did uh -huh. and saved it are doing just fine today they, they'll tell you they're not yeah you know they a lot of these guys are great they for they'd boo their own grandmother right <laughs> but but behind the scenes they're actually doing really well yeah because a lot of smart carriers paid off their truck and trailer debt during the pandemic during, yes and instead of costing a buck 80 a mile today they can run for a buck 50. And while rates are low, they're getting by just fine. And I'll tell you they're not, but I know they're getting by. Now there's some carriers that aren't because they bought an older truck that's they paid a lot more for and they've got to run a lot harder. Yeah. Uh, but generally, generally, most carriers can get by today. But if you start to talk about slowing them down, um, to me it's like the drug clearing house, BLDs and speed limiters. They're all ways to slow down the industry and make a level playing field. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. So carriers have got to think this through. I don't like the speed limiters because of the lack of safety angle. But I think it'll create a less safe outcome because you've already got speed limited fleets, drivers being mm -hmm. told to stay in the center lane and don't look. Yeah, why is that? Uh, well, they, they claim that it's safer and it's less distracting. Mm -hmm. I would argue it's worse. Uh, but anyway, they apparently know better. Um, I, I just think it'll create a much safer highway, just like ELDs have made it much less safe for all yeah. of us on the road because everyone's cutting corners and rushing and uh, taking chances. There's a lot of new new technology that's supposed to improve our lives is making things more dangerous. Well, it's put a safety net around inexperienced drivers and yes. allowed them to be more disconnected from the driving task and they can be more distracted because an adaptive cruise or lane departure or collision avoidance alarm is going to go off. So what you do is you have a false this sense of security. False sense of security. Yeah. And it's like when ABS brakes came in, accidents went up. Because ah. you brake later and harder. Yeah. Same thing will happen here. Very interesting. Yeah. It's too bad. It's ruining, it's ruining a, a great industry. Yeah. Well, I like to say you've got to drive a truck but steer a car. Well, ah. a lot of trucks these days, you just steer them. You don't have to drive them, just sit and steer. You, you've heard yeah. that steering wheel holder. Steering wheel holder term. Yeah. Well, that's, what that's it means. because you can sit there and steer because you've got all this technology around you that sort of does a lot of your work for you. But I like to drive a truck, you know, I don't want it to be comfortable and quiet necessarily. I want it to be I'm loud and obnoxious, yeah. like a truck should be. Yeah. Feel like a truck, smell like a truck, sound like a truck. Like, like this right here. Flip the bumper here, get the Schneider guy up wave as we go by. Pride has a colour. I love that ad Schneider had years ago. Pride has a colour. Oh, I never heard that the one. orange ads. Remember the orange colour? I'm sure their drivers are very prideful of those colours. They're a good fleet. They're, they're one of the few fleets that I really admire that care about safety in their business. They do? Don Schneider was always like that. Who else, who else do you like? Uh, I like, you know, people like Dupre Logistics. I like the Dupre. Dupre Logistics, Lafayette, Louisiana. Oh, oh Dupre, yeah, yeah. yeah. Dupre, they haul hazmat, right? Reggie Dupre, yep. Yep. Uh, Twenty-four-seven hazmat chemicals. Uh, Dayton Freight, LTL, one of one of my best customers I've ever had. Mm -hmm. and Praxair. Uh, Praxair, there's, yeah. There's a, there's a handful of really good companies, but the reality is, most. Most fleets don't want to go the extra mile and do something over and above what the regulations require, mm -hmm. which is teach people how to sleep. Run your schedules around a driver's sleep pattern, not around the work. Like, have the guts to go to a shipper and say, hey, this pickup time doesn't work. 
this appointment doesn't work for us. Here's why. And if you just try it, you'll be surprised at how But do you think there's say, a big fear in losing those customers oh, to other people? In this market, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a time to do it. But most carriers that are in a small town that have grown mm -hmm. up with a shipper, they load five or six loads a week. You can go and talk to them and say, hey, here's, here's what we want to do. Right. <clears throat> but even if you're preloading 10 trailers to go out on a Sunday night, you can still talk to your drivers about their departure time. Yeah, you might say, sure. Yeah, like there's things you can do. If but it's not going to work for companies to try to monopolize the freight. No. And are going after every business. They're going to pro make promises they can't keep safely. Right. Because how do you differentiate yourself in a market where rates are so low? You do it on you know, transit time, delivery time. Yeah, I can be there. Mm -hmm. You know, the manager says, yeah, I'll be there. But what at what cost to the driver? Yeah. Right. So you know, you know, I know as drivers that it's the hurry up and wait. Yeah. The yes. How many times have we, you know, double tarped a load of steel right. and get there and find out it's going to be parked out in the middle of the yard for three months? Like, yeah. And, what, <laughs> and, and then what about all these brokers? Yeah. These brokers who are saying, I have a truck in the area and, and the truck hasn't even unloaded <laughs> yet. And, and, and the promises that. This is, so the bottom part of a freight cycle like this that's been going on for 27 months now, where rates are soft and demand is soft, and it's going to be like that for the rest of the year, folks. Um, what happens at the bottom of part of the cycle, the broker's margins are getting compressed because they're bidding for freight as the rates come down mm -hmm. in the cycle. So their margins are compressed. They're trying to compete for freight and win market share. Carriers' costs have been are going up as the rates are coming down. Mm -hmm. So everybody's margins are getting compressed and everybody's making promises they probably shouldn't be making. Right. And, and that's what ends up happening is the truck driver is left to try and put the pieces of the puzzle mm -hmm. back together. And we're really good at that. And, and it's all on our shoulders. It's all on our shoulders. Yeah. And, and you're only as good as last, your last load. And there's a cost mm. economically to that because uh, that you might hurt your pay. But it'll, long term, it'll hurt your health. Because if that meant sleep deprivation and stress and anger and not eating properly and not you know, looking after your own body, you'll pay for that eventually, as we all see when we travel around. Mm. And this is a career. You want to have a, yeah. a happy ending to it. You I, see, I see my father everywhere. Yeah. You know, not, not literally, not in a spooky I way. I understand, yeah. But he, he died of his second heart attack from undiagnosed sleep apnea all his work life. Second, oh, wow. and, and even in the ER, they didn't realize in the 90s that his <gasps> gasping for air was sleep apnea. Mm. They thought it was the heart attack. And, uh, and they were treating him for all the wrong things. All he needed was a CPAP machine to breathe. But what he did as a trucker, get up at three in the morning, go to work, he would drink a six pack of beer and smoke cigarettes to mm -hmm. self-medicate all day because his head hurt from mm. lack of sleep. Because if you're always <gasps> gasping for yeah. every minute, you never drift into deep sleep. You never get any quality. You're in bed eight hours, but sure. you wake up with this crushing headache and you hate the world. And that's what causes a lot of the symptoms related to depression and anxiety and things like that. Because you lack the mental faculties to cope with the stress. Mm -hmm. And truck driving is a really stressful job. You've got to have good quality sleep to cope with it. So what would be your suggestion? <clears throat> Somebody's new to the industry, doesn't have the background that you and I have. Yeah. What's a few key things they should know and learn yeah. to have a successful career in it? So start work at the same time every day. I don't care whether it's 2 a.m., 3 a.m., 4 a.m. Because if you start work at the same time, you lock in this thing called anchor sleep. Mm -hmm. We have an inbuilt drive in our brain for anchor sleep. Mm -hmm. Same place, same time every day. It's, in, it's inbuilt, subconscious. Wow. So if you lock in your start time, you lock in your wake time and you lock in your bedtime. The worst thing truck companies do is have an inconsistent start time, which mm -hmm. as over-the-road drivers, we never had a same start time, did we? No. So same start time, get six hours minimum sleep every 24, make sure you have naps and get two periods of night sleep every seven. If you get two periods of night sleep on your days off, even if it's a 34 hour reset, make sure you get two periods of night sleep where you go to bed when you're tired, wake up when you're done sleeping. Mm -hmm. That will give you the best chance of success. So two periods means don't set your alarm to wake yep, up. Just wake up when you're done because the brain will wake you up when it's dispensed the sleep debt from the previous mm. week. You got to get two and seven, six hours every 24, start work at the same time. And I think the other one is the caffeine rule, right? So caffeine's got a half life of six hours. So. <clears throat> My rule is never have, don't drink caffeine after 3 p.m. or 3 a.m. Because three hours after that, half it's trying to keep you awake. Uh -huh. So at 9 a.m. or 9 p.m., half the caffeine is still trying to wake you up. 
and the sleep gate won't open unless you've got the caffeine wearing off and the tiredness building. Mm. So your sleep gate sometimes won't open until late night because you had caffeine and Mountain Dew and Diet Coke at, at supper. Mm. And yeah. it's still trying to keep you awake. <laughs> yeah. So. That's some good advice. Yeah, yeah let's it, go. Let's it go. Works. Let's go get some caffeine. <laughs> good idea. We're on the New York Thruway, just out between Syracuse and Utica. Me and Dean and the Grumpy Pete. Time for a refill? No, I'm good. I think I'm good. I Don't think you're good. You, you had one. That's enough, right? Yeah. What a beautiful day here. It's gorgeous, freeway. yeah. I think people are going to start waking up. I think traffic's going to start pumping. Maybe I'll do a little driving. Yeah, let's see. I might get in the bunk and sleep. Take a nap. Hour and a half. You know, you know I do my best sleep in a sleeper cab when it's driving. Really? Yeah, love it. I did when I was a kid. Yeah, same here. I tried a couple team runs in my early years to Vegas. Yep. I didn't sleep for a week. If you know the other driver, it's, you know. Yeah, if you, know if you trust. Yeah. So you probably won't sleep well then. No, if I know the other person sleeps well, I'm. I'm I slept well last night. Yeah.